I'm Isaac Bauman, and this is the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben, how's it going? It's going super swell. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm uh, testing out a new camera system. If it works, anyone who's watching us on YouTube might see at least my side of the conversation looks slightly better than it has in the past. I don't know yet. If it looks terrible, that means it didn't work and we're going to try something else. Mine still looks the same because I'm using the Charles Pappert recommended system of Camo Studio and my iPhone's uh, rear facing cameras. So uh, you're, you're looking at iPhone 14 Pro Max camera glory here. Nice. And when Zoom's done with it, it'll look like an iPhone 6. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So, so Ben, who's on the show today? Uh, it is Isaac Bauman. It was an interview you did. It, so. it sure was. It was a great conversation. We talked a ton about Loki season two, which, uh, which is, yeah, probably my, my favorite Marvel series to date. And that's saying something because I really liked some of the other series. So th- this is this is really it was really a fun conversation. And we are going to get into that in just a few minutes. But first, we have our close focus. And now close focus. What is sort of going on in the world of the industry right now, Ben? It's, it's you know, there's a there's a lot of stuff happening, but but what are, what are we going to talk? About? Well, there's a lot of stuff happening, but like most of what we could really talk about is uh, people gearing up post the strikes. Uh, you know, we still I don't believe have had a SAG membership vote on the new contract, to my knowledge. Uh, uh, but SAG yeah, is de- out of striking. So December fourteenth, I think, is the deadline for yeah. the ratification. So it's going to take a little bit. So one thing that kind of came across the transom is uh, is is an award. Uh, I I think it's kind of the first award program of the season, and that's the Gotham Awards. And it occurred to me I don't know uh, di- or didn't know doodly squat about the Gotham Awards, but they are kind of an interesting uh, predictor of uh, what's to come. You know, as we head into all the other awards, because there's a uh, you know a a, a a metric f ton of awards coming our way in the next few months, and uh, and a bunch of movies vying for them. So uh, tell me about the Gotham Awards, Ilya. Yeah, the Gotham Awards are uh, it's a, it's a forty year old award uh, ceremony, and essentially it comes out of the original uh, IFP, the Independent Feature Project, which of course on the West Coast became Film Independent, and on the East Coast in New York became the Gotham Awards, and uh, they have been sort of a predictor of you know the future Oscar races. Uh, they were the first uh, big award for uh, everything everywhere all at once, which is cool. And this year they give away a ton of awards and they also removed the budget cap. So studio projects that are submitted. I was was surprised that there was a budget cap and I was surprised that they removed it. Yeah, uh, that's cap said that if your budget was over 35 million, this award ceremony is not for you. Basically, they were saying that, like, you know, we're here for independence. We're you know, that's what we're recognizing. And I still feel that even though that cap has been removed, they probably very heavily are still in the indie. And I I say indie with like, you know, 35 million dollar budget. You know, there's different levels of indie for sure. But uh, it definitely sort of feels feels like 35 million doesn't doesn't sound like you pulled it out of the couch cushions. Exactly. Yeah, uh, hardly. It wasn't, you know, your daddy's credit card that you that you uh, charge you maxed out to to make your you know magna opus. It's um it's an interesting uh, event. Uh, Robert Nero spoke there, and actually, it's been widely reported was censored. His speech was censored. He waded into political territory where he was talking about fake news and Donald Trump. And I, I guess I hear I hear that De Niro, not the biggest Trump fan. Yeah, not not so much. It sounds like, yeah, really yeah. not a not a fan. So uh, yeah, anyway, well, and I heard about this, too, by the way, it's like he wasn't just like censored in the live feed or something. He had written a speech that was on the teleprompter and someone had gone and deleted the stuff that they didn't want from his speech in the teleprompter. And uh, De Niro will notice this because he, he, the average De Niro speech is about 14 words long. So <laughs> I, I, my, my, I had a film that played Tribeca years ago and you get to go to a big luncheon with Robert De Niro and it's a big mm. thing. And like, uh, by contrast, my wife, Alicia, she uh, had a film that played Sundance and um, Robert Redford takes everyone to a 
big awesome lunch and talks to them for like 45 minutes de niro took took the podium and was like hey everyone thank you uh we wouldn't have this festival without your films enjoy the food and he was out short and sweet de niro out (laughs) dropped the mic threw the mic threw it hit me in the face ow stop it bob all right yeah it's very violent man You've seen the movies, I, but anyway, anyway, so yeah, <laughs> out, out of the, you know, 27 words that he was going to say in a speech, you know, five of them were taken out or whatever. Well, uh, he, he didn't let it slide. He, it sounds like was like, nor, you know, nor should he, <laughs> nor should he. And it's interesting too, because like part of what he was talking about, from what I understand from variety and the other, and the trade magazines is that he was really railing against, you know, this environment of, you know, not knowing what's trustworthy, not knowing what information, you know, to, to believe out there. And then, of course, that's the stuff that gets cut from his speech, which is kind of like, what? <laughs> I don't know. There, there's something there's something that the interplay there that just strikes me as slightly ironic that, you know, that was the stuff that w- that was really excised. Anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah so the little. Guy- yeah, a little, a little bit of the snake eating its own tail there. And, uh, and you know, it should be said, too, you know, with being the founder of the Tribeca Film Festival, he's not a lightweight when it comes to independent cinema in New York. You know, he's practically, uh, no, he's he's, practically he's synonymous it. with it, really. When you think about it, where did he come from? He came from doing <laughs> came movies from Mean Brian Streets. De Palma, yeah. Brian De Palma movies and yeah, Martin Scorsese movies in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Indie which films. was which yeah, indie films uh, on the East Coast, indie films in New York. So he's about as, you know, as indie New York as you can get from, you know, way back when he's got the old school cred for sure. Uh, so actually on the website, on the official uh, cinematography podcast website, Cam Noir, in the show notes for this episode, we will put a link to the Gotham Awards where you can find out who all the winners are. They cover both uh, movies and television, and uh, you can find out all the different people who, who and won. And research the Gotham Awards. They're a big yeah. thing. I, uh, they're a yeah. big thing. They've been around for 40 years, for God's sakes. Don't be like me until yesterday. <laughs> know something about the Gotham Awards. Dang it. Well, you know, uh, you're on the West Coast, being a little bit West Coast centric. I know it's not as front of mind, but if you're in New York, which has, you know, arguably the second largest or maybe third largest, you know, film community yeah. in the country, uh, it's a big deal. Really big. I just assumed Batman won every year. <laughs> hey, let's get to the interview with Isaac Bauman. Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm joined now by Isaac Bauman, uh, the cinematographer of season two of Loki. Welcome to the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you for having me, Ilya. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, you haven't just been doing this like the last week or so. You didn't just like wake up recently and decide that that you were going to be a DP. You've been shooting. It looks like you got your start in music videos and you've been doing this for a long time. Tell us a little bit about your backstory. How did you get into doing this as a career? Yeah, you know, it's a long story, but um, I went to USC film school. I met someone there who's still one of my best friends in the whole world, Leroy Coons, and he convinced me to drop out with him and shoot our first feature film in the fall of 2009. It was going to be during school. You know, dropping out wasn't our first choice, but it was like making a movie takes longer than summer break. So we left USC together. We made a movie. And then from there, I started shooting pretty low budget, no budget rap videos that I would find on Craigslist or short films that I would find on Craigslist with my 5D Mark II package. And I was in that game for a few years and eventually started to shoot bigger and better music videos, which led to commercials and some cool short films, which eventually led to having a real narrative career. Nice. Yeah, I, I got to ask you, uh, whatever happened with that original feature film that you guys made that you dropped out of school for? Was it was it yeah. totally worth worth the experience? It totally was. Before we made that movie, I didn't even realize that I wanted to be a cinematographer. In fact, Leroy had been asking me to shoot short films for him in school, school projects for quite a while. And I was politely declining because I didn't understand why I would want to help another director make their movies when I was so focused on my own. You know, because I saw myself as a director. It's not that I didn't wish the best for him or whatever. It was just like, I'm making my own movies over here. And that's my priority. And the, the idea, I, I just, I'd made so many films my whole life. You know, I was one of those kids that got a really early start with his dad's camcorder. 
And so I had a ton of experience and I was focused on my own work and I didn't, I didn't even understand that there was a difference between the director and the DP and the editor and the producer and even the actors could just cause I did absolutely every single thing in every movie I'd ever made. And so the idea of just doing the camera and it being on someone else's film was totally foreign and entirely unappealing to me. But when this project that he kept talking about morphed into a real feature that was really going to happen, I felt like I couldn't say no. And we became good friends. And through the process of making the film, I realized that it had been cinematography and working with the camera and the lighting and the image that had been my passion all along. And I just, because I wasn't aware that, you know, filmmaking was broken down into all of these different departments. I never was able to say, or I never needed to say, this is what I wanted to focus on. But that's where my heart always had been, I realized. And it was an easy transition into, all right, I'm a DP now. That film is called A Beer Tale. And believe it or not, it was it got picked up by a distributor who put it into Redbox, which was very popular at the time. It ended up making... Uh, a lot of money and we were able to get our second film made and we actually just made our uh, third film together very recently that just came out and it's called Deliver Us. Nice. All right. That's exciting. Will it also be in yeah. Redbox? Or is it have they, having <laughs> a different know if distribution? I Redboxes exist anymore. Oh, it still exists. It's just not not as many places as as, as you remember. Okay. So, yeah. you, uh, yeah. okay. We're going we're gonna to take two steps back here because you, you give me a lot to unpack in that. Um, yeah. Okay. So, USC... You entered USC thinking that, you know, you might be doing it all. You might be one man banding. You like you wanted to be a director. And it wasn't until make, getting onto this feature and really kind of getting things departmentalized. Did you realize that that's not where your love was? Your love was was behind the camera and the camera was really what it was about. Or was there some other point before that that was like that was like the magic moment where it all kind of dawned on you? I think a lot of YouTubers and creators are, sort of go through this thing right now because their mindset is and that they do everything. And a lot of them really do do everything. And of course, when you try to do everything, it's tough to do everything well. It's much easier if you can specialize and do one you know, craft or one job, one thing really, really well and have other people around you who do their jobs really well. So talk about that moment of like inspiration or moment of clarity yeah. where you realize that this was not what you thought it was and it's something else entirely. Good question. I, my journey to understanding that where my strength lie was much more humiliating than a realization on my own behalf. It was, it came in the form of feedback from my fellow USC students. So I would make these movies, these short films. There was this common thread of feedback that was always coming in, which was, it looks beautiful. It's very well edited. The soundtrack is great, but the story is a little off and the performances are incredibly wooden. Mm. It was almost like what I was doing. It was funny. Someone said this out loud, I believe. They said it was like I was using the actors as models instead of actors because oh, the wow. performances were just so it was because I was so focused what it turned out was they that person was right and I was simply so focused on the image the photographic image and the composition that I was using the actors like mannequins practically and it was like their performances were totally secondary to the position that they occupied in the frame and the compositional elements. And it was just, I, I was using them like little chess pieces rather than dramatic performers. Mm. And, and that seemed to be the case in my productions, no matter what the genre or the story itself. Uh, it just somehow we always came back to this, like the act, the acting is not existent if Isaac is directing the film. Um, <laughs> tough room, tough room. So, yeah, intro yeah, to film class. Yeah, yeah. T -t -t like you're, you're in there with a bunch of critics. That I mean, I, I, I will tell you that I think that uh, you know it doesn't surprise me. USC has a reputation of being you know uh, a one, always in the in the, the top ranks of film schools in the country. That you'd have a very discerning group of classmates who who really were going to give you their 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 criticism and maybe not necessarily totally support you in 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 the uh, you know the, the creative journey. But but beyond that, you drop out. 
about. You make this movie. Do you ever go back to school? Do you ever go back and finish? Or is that just a, a chapter of your life you closed and you, you went on to the new professional you? You know, I finally realized that I was becoming successful when my father approached me with the idea that maybe I should go back to school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, because he always tells me exactly the opposite of what I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sounds, sounds like you've got a good relationship with your father. Or your father is just really, really good at telling you what you should do. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, he, he is. Just do the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, so, so I, I, no, I never thought back. That, I mean, the truth is those first few years out of school, like I said, a beer tail was successful, but it didn't really lead to anything career wise, especially not anytime soon. Yes, we continue to build our relationship as a filmmaking team. And as I just mentioned, we we just released another film together, which is great. But but no, it didn't actually really lead anywhere that I could grasp onto and pull myself forward up that career ladder. So uh, I was pretty much on my own with this 5D package shooting rap videos and uh, short films from Craigslist. I know that yeah. era uh, quite well because that's exactly when I started my company. And one of the big products from starting my company, I was the first person to modify the Canon 70s and 5Ds to put PL mounts on them. And cool. an awful lot of our clients were out shooting rap videos. A lot of clients are off shooting, yeah. you know, uh, just sort of $3,000 to $5,000 budget music videos, like really low stuff. Like the camera costs more than the budget yeah. for, that, for, that, for the video. So, totally. Uh, yeah. That, those were humble beginnings then. Back yeah. In, in so, days, yeah. yeah, it was a struggle. I was making very little. Often I wasn't even able to negotiate to to have the kit be be separate from my own rate. You know, mm. it was like, here's two hundred dollars for everything for you and your package. Oh. Uh, fortunately, I never I was never one of those guys that was like also editing the videos or anything like that. So I could just kind of show up for a day or two and take the money and run. But I learned a lot about that type of filmmaking and I got really good at that type of filmmaking. And eventually one of those videos turned into something uh, really special. I met a filmmaker at Stanford. I hung out at Stanford a lot in those days because I went to high school in Palo Alto and a lot of my friends went to Stanford. Sure. I met a, a young filmmaker, Abtin Begheri, at Stanford and... I'm a little bit older than him, but when he was graduating, he hit me up and said he had a no budget rap video that he was looking to shoot in New York. And I thought, cool, you know, get to go to New York. I bought my own ticket. I thought I was going to get reimbursed for it. I never was. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> oops. Yeah. But yeah, but anyhow, we shot a video in Harlem for a totally unknown rapper called ASAP Rocky. And that song, that video was Peso. That video ended up blowing up and blowing up Rocky. Mm. Um, it was just this huge e explosion of hype. And uh, that, not immediately, like many things, but eventually that led to Obtain and I working on a series of videos where each one was a little bit bigger and a lot better than the last one. And we made a couple of videos back to back in the spring of 2012 now we're talking about that that were just genuinely good on a professional level for mm -hmm. at least for the level of production that was happening in music videos at that time. And at that point, both of us were able to then have careers working, you know, in the music video industry of that time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to say the story that I hear from everyone who makes it in music videos, but they make a music mm -hmm. video that actually like moves the needle. Something happens. Something really happens from that. Yeah. And then based yeah. on that, it's a little bit like winning, you know, the career lottery. It's not like you you win the grand prize or like, I should say the, the you know, the, the slot machine. Like you got three sevens and then all of a sudden, like, you know, your next six jobs pop out. You know, it's you're, you're able to get, you know, move on stepping stones, you know, one to the other to the other. Uh, tell me about your break to get out of the music video grind and start to then work into other parts of, of the industry. I mean, I know you already started with with features and had done some feature work, but uh, I, I get the feeling that your mm -hmm. early features in those early days of music video is a pretty long stretch of difference in production value and resources compared to Marvel. So I know that you've got a few more steps in the way here. So so what what's next for you? What's the big turning yeah. point in your career? Yeah. So, you know, the music videos were great. 
but I think I don't know for sure, but I'm I'm guessing what led a little bit more directly into the narrative were the short films that I started to make around the same time. So I always mm. kept I started doing a ton of music videos. I was fully supporting myself with music videos for many, many years. But while that was happening, I was also shooting the occasional short film. And I don't know what it was, but I the short films that found their way to me were short films that just they really were the type of work that I'd always wanted to do as a filmmaker growing up, which was work in genre. You know, when I say mm -hmm. genre, what I'm really referring to is anything except a drama or a comedy. Because, you know, so many short films are dramas, you know, like all of the festival short films. Coming or these age. like sketch comedy-ish. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, the first big-ish, you know, first like cool short film I got offered was a, a filmmaker. I shot a music video for, Saman Kesh, at the end of 2012. That that first year that I started gaining traction with music videos, I did a music video with Saman and he was like, Hey, I'd love if you shot my next short film. Saman and I jammed. He knew, you know, what I was interested in, but I, I grew up on Star Trek, Star Wars, a lot of sci-fi action, horror to a certain degree. And he was going to do a sci-fi action short film called controller in Taipei, which mm -hmm. was a high concept, futuristic, uh, Kung Fu, story set in Taipei and it was it was like sponsored by a video game or something but there's nothing from the game in the short film it's like their logo is on a mug in the background of one scene or something like that and I think eventually they may have even washed their hands of any involvement and not used it to promote the game so it was really cool and it got a lot of attention and Saman and I did another short film called Hit TV, which was about, it was loosely based on a video game about a hitman in Miami. So it's very like 80s, synthy, neon, but ultra violent. And I met a filmmaker, Luke Guilford, who I did a short film with called Connected with Pam Anderson around this time. It's like a black mirror type of thing. And so all of these short films I'm doing, they're all like exactly 10 minutes long, basically super high concept and genre focused and all have very distinct visual identities. I think though, I think that body of work, those short films really is what caught the attention of the person who ultimately hired me to do something that I was not qualified to do, you know, because if filmmaking, the career is always this catch 22. You can't do a job unless you've already done that job before, you know? So it's like, how do you get a TV show if you've never shot a TV show before? How do you get a movie? If you, you know, someone's got to hire you when you're not technically qualified, you know, they just have to see it in you. So do, do you think that these people are, oh, do you think that this person was aware that you weren't technically qualified or do you think that you, you know, uh, you faked it until you made it? You think that uh, you were able to, you know, impress upon them that you were ready and that you could do it? This person is just a big supporter and a big believer. And I think when he gets excited by something he sees, he sees, he just sees the potential. He, there's no fear. It's just all potential. I'm talking about Nick Antosca, who is a showrunner a very successful showrunner now, who at the time was just getting his first show off the ground. It was called Channel Zero, and it was on the Sci-Fi Channel. And it was a real show. You know, it was like shooting in Canada, many millions of dollars budget for the season. I mean, it's a small budget show, but, you know, for someone who never even shot a million dollar movie, you're walking on to like a $20 million season of television and you're in charge. Big step up, you know? And I ended up getting this job shooting Channel Zero, which is an anthology show. So each season is a totally different story, different cast, and a different director who directs the entire season of six episodes. The first season I shot was actually the second season of the show. It was called Channel Zero No End House, directed by Stephen Pyatt. At the time, I think it felt like I'd been working a long time. But now looking back, having my first traction at anything, at like low budget music videos in 2012, I'm on set of Channel Zero or there in prep just over four years later. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that, so it that's, happens that's pretty, pretty quickly. Quick. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a very quick timeline. Uh, a lot of people work, pretty work, quick. work for decades and don't have that, uh, that sort of uh, change. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Isaac, I want to shift gears just a little bit here. Tell me about DPs or filmmakers that inspire you. Is there... Uh, 
who influences your your style of uh, of lighting, of, of framing, or do you try not to watch other people's stuff? Do you try just to you know have have your own look, your own vision? In the early days of the music videos, the the good music videos, I was super influenced by Tree of Life. Mm-hmm. Terrence Malick and and just Lubezki in general, and and then I've always really looked up to the work of Roger Deakins. I've there's, never heard of him. Just sorry, <laughs> sorry. Such a I, tasteful... I already used that joke. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny though because for all the praise he gets and for all of the um, influence that that people attribute to him, I don't see many people's work who having you know obvious signs of having been influenced by Deacons. You know, it's like er, he's the best, but like no one really copies his style that much. It's an interesting conundrum. Um, and I, the reason why I think that is, is because his style is so tasteful and so elegant and so mature. But what sells, what you're seeing out there in music videos and commercials and movies is a trendy look. And like a contemporary and tre- trendy look People feel obligated to do it to get hired, basically, or to have their production seem relevant. And in a lot of ways, it's really the opposite of the Deacon's look. So it's it's funny, as much as everyone loves him, I, I'm not seeing his influence in cinema as an art form in general. Of course, I, I would you know, agree with that. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah. I, and it's interesting because like, if I think back about like the movies of G. McG is highly influential. It's like you, you'll see like, you know, a movie's a hit and then suddenly a particular style becomes like in vogue and everyone wants that sort of style. I, I definitely agree. I think Deacons kind of has his palette. He has his style. His movies feel like a Roger Deacons movie and he sticks with it, which I which I think is, is uh, impressive and mature. I, I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad that there are the Deacons out there who's just going to do what he's going to do. So, yeah. So Terrence Malick, big influence. Uh, anybody else? Anyone else who's uh, you think influenced your aesthetic or your the way that you like uh, things to look? You know what I did? I always say that I'm not really influenced by individual cinematographers as much as I am by individual films. And mm-hmm. even I might take that even further. It's I actually have a list on Letterboxd of the films that I think most influence my visual style. I could pull up. But what? I think really has influenced me is actually the amalgamation of hundreds of movies that I spent countless hours screen capping and studying, (laughs) not all of which are films that are traditionally, you know, looked at as good examples of cinematography. And I think I just have looked at so many images so closely that somehow they've all kind of combined into this reservoir of of knowledge and visual experience in my mind that I think is this like kind of subconscious dreamlike state that's up there that I'm pulling from more than I'm actually pulling from or being influenced by like the dozen films that are on the list that I referred to. Sure, sure. So we've talked now for a little while and mm-hmm. I haven't gotten into to Loki at all. And I really want to get into Loki now because uh, Loki season two my personal favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe series by far, like uh, of everything that's out there. And I think I actually got to say, I liked season two even more than season one, which is really high praise. I, th- I think that it, it's really a, a phenomenal bit of uh, serialized television and it's only like six episodes. So that's like, it's, a, it's an amazing amount of stuff happening in such a short period of time. There's a lot of wide angles. There's a lot of handheld. The sort of monochromatic themes, there's a lot of monochromatic sort of colors and palettes playing through, especially on the lighting, especially on people's skin, especially like, you know, inside the TVA and in certain settings that that uh, that happen through these set pieces that happen throughout it. Tell me a little bit about your take on this, because, uh, you know, Autumn, you know, friend of the show, been on the show, did a great job with, with season one. Uh, you've got a different take. You've got a different vision for this. Tell me about, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, low angles, still a lot seeing ceilings. I think this is wonderful. A lot of, you know, over, overhead light and such. But tell me about your take on an established show shot by ASC cinematographer. You're coming in, taking over. What's your your read on this? How, how do you approach that? Yeah, you know, I realized pretty quickly that what made the first season with regard to the cinematography, I'm only speaking about the cinematography here. What made season one of Loki so special was Autumn bringing herself to the project. If you look at the style of season one, it is very consistent with the films she had done prior to Loki season one, 
what you're getting in Loki season one is a full blown Autumn Gerald Arkapaw look trademarked. And I think that's what made it the look so successful because she's a great cinematographer. She is a voice and she fully brought herself to the project. She obviously wasn't attempting in any way to make it blend or, you know, fit with the larger canvas of Marvel projects. She was just doing her own look, the autumn look. And when you're shooting the second season of a show, you know, the question is, well, continuity is important. You know, the story that's continuing has to be the same story and it's the same actors and, and all that. But when it came to the look, I realized it would do a disservice to the show to try to for Isaac to do what Autumn does. Because if you look at our bodies of work individually prior to Loki, both of us prior to Loki, there's, there's just there's no overlap our work couldn't look more different than it does. We're completely different DPs who do everything completely different from each other. And we're both coming from perspectives that are very grounded in experience and preference and and our own tastes, and, and they're both valid. We've just arrived at much different conclusions about what cinematography ought to be. So I realized the thing to do was in a way to do exactly what Autumn did, just not literally. It was looking a little deeper to what her actual approach was. And what her approach was just to bring herself fully, her toolkit, her autumn toolkit to the table. So I was like, all right, well, you know what? I, I would like to do exactly what autumn did, which meant throwing out everything she brought to the show. And it meant starting from scratch and rebuilding it in my own image. So we found out that sounds a little dramatic, but we got word pretty quickly right away that Marvel and the, the creatives in charge of the show were going to be entirely supportive of that approach. So there was never really any doubt. There was never let us think about that. And I was never asked to continue the work that she had done. Um, as soon as I proposed the new ideas and when I started talking out loud about what I thought the season was going to look like, I got nothing but support and encouragement. Spectacular. That, that's great. You, yeah. you didn't have to prepare lookbooks and presentations and sell oh people. Oh my God. I had to, oh yeah. Oh, I did all that. Yeah. I had to do all that. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, but when I showed them that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we had to get a sign off, but it just mm -hmm. happened really quickly. I put that stuff together really quickly mm -hmm. and we got a sign off really quickly. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, all right. So, so you've got this body of work. You've got this this great season, this standalone season of television. Uh, Marvel comes to you and says, "Isaac, we want we want you to do this. We want your vision, your take." They sign off on it. Did it shoot in the UK? Where did you guys Where did you guys shoot season two? I, mm -hmm. I do, was it same yeah. same same yeah. set? Same okay. You were back we in the shot same... in London. Okay. A any virtual stage? All practical sets? How did you How did you pull this off? No virtual. There's one. To be honest, there's a scene that I feel that we should have shot on the volume, just one scene one day, wasn't that big of a deal. But uh, Marvel's pretty hesitant to use the volume because they have a lot of experience with it and their experience has been that it doesn't necessarily fit in the best way with how they like to work in post, you know, because you, it just doesn't, it really minimizes flexibility ultimately. You get locked in, the volume really locks you in. So they, they generally prefer to use blue screen, but of course on Loki, we try to rely as much as we can on full 360 set belts. You know, you were mentioning the ceilings and stuff. Uh, the production designer, Kasra Farahani, was the one who originally brought this to the show. And he came in swinging in the first season. He, he sold them on building sets to a degree that Marvel had not before and tried to make every possible environment with four walls and a ceiling. We shot several, you know, anytime, basically, anytime you're out on the gangway in the, you know, approaching the loom. Oh, yeah, that wasn't practical? Blue screen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's blue screen, but like... You didn't have strands of time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's Got about it. it. The rest of the season is you're on a set. We, the, the, the philosophy is called light the space, not the shot. And it's even better if you can light the space with practicals. Uh, the lighting is all built into the ceilings in 90% of the sets, even non-TVA, certainly in the TVA, even non-TVA sets, there's a lot of light in the ceilings. 
which is consistent with how the first season was. We didn't. We actually. There's not a lot of overlap between seasons one and two. What sets were on, even in the, even though we're both in the TVA. So the overhead lighting creates a really beautiful light. It's just very dramatic. However, it causes a lot of issues. You know, it's like those actors they get the like raccoon eye type of thing, and the nose is hot. And you can't see the eyes. And I, my entire career, I've been afraid of that. I've always relied on side lighting. I've been afraid of of overhead lighting for that reason. And this was a really good opportunity to learn to work with it because I was forced to. And not only do we have the overhead lighting, but the camera this season is running all over the place because we switched to handheld and the block. we really opened up the blocking to let the actors take the lead. There's not a lot of these formal things where someone has to be standing here and someone's got to be standing there. It's like the scenes are full of energy and motion and the, the actors are just always moving and these cameras are on wide spherical lenses following the actors around, panning between actors. You know, we try to combine as many shots as we can in one take. So we're rarely ever just shooting like one person's face. You know, it'll always pan off their look all the way across the room or whatever and circle back to them. It's just crazy. There's nowhere. There is just simply nowhere that we possibly could have hidden any lights on the set, on the floor of the set. Even if I'd wanted to, if we had shot it in that the style that I'm describing, which is what the directors wanted to do. There was just no opportunity to light it except with the practicals. So what we did was, yes, we had a battery powered gem ball LED that we used for an eye light. It was about 22 inches in diameter. It was kind of on the medium size. You know, there's small ones, medium, big. But this had, to, you know, the bigger, the better, but also the, the less movable it is when it gets too big and it had to run alongside the camera for 90 days you know so we ended up with kind of like we tested everything we tested a million one things for this but we ended up with like a i believe a 22 inch gem ball with an led yoke and ribbon in it and it would always be on the actor's eye line you know it's always coming from you know because you don't want the eye light on the shadow side because then it'll be filling in the so we always had it on key side on eyeline side and it's amazing for handheld footage and sets that are lit with overhead practicals exclusively the characters they i swear they always have eye light and it's always this with this eye light that i'm talking about it's a spark uh, with a backpack and a painter's pole hollywooding that thing. i i I, to- I totally get it and and you pull it off yeah. beautifully it's it's pulled off so so well uh, all right i gotta ask you what sort of base iso are you working with here and what kind of stop because when you're talking about like you know practical lights and a, and a, and a gem ball we're talking about fairly low numbers of foot candles we're not talking about a, a high key set are are you shooting mm. wide open? Are you shooting high ISO? What? How do you how do you split that? How do you how do you oh, how yeah. do you figure out what, what, how you want to yeah. do? Yeah, I don't. I do not fuck around when it comes to exposure. I light the hell out of any set that I'm on. We we were we exposed all sets to a T four mm-hmm. at ISO three twenty. Wow! Yes. All right, yeah, yes. that's what, you got some pretty, light in there. Yeah, pretty bright. It was real bright. On these sets, and I'll, I'll walk you through why we did that. It's because our zoom lens, which we used frequently, was a T4. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I'm ever going to do is demand to relight a whole set because we have to put the zoom lens on. You know, my attitude is whatever the brightest exposure you're going to need, just light the set to that in the beginning, and then you never have to worry about it. And you just use ND if you don't need to hit that exposure. So we wanted that same really dark, moody look from the first season, but I wanted to preserve our ability to extract shadow detail in post-production. Wow. Yeah, that's, it's really clever. It's a, it's a, you know, maximum control, maximum flexibility. You have all, all the look that you want and then some, because you can always take it down. It's really hard to bring it up if you needed to bring it up a little. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Well, well, well done. I, I, okay. So you shot with a, with a slow zoom lens. I'm assuming this is a, is, is an ingenue lens or something. What, what were you using? That was uh that was a, a four. It was an ingenue. It was an ingenue yeah. 28 to 340. Oh yeah. That's, that's right. Which is that's their a, full. It's like their 12 X full frame one. 
instead of sure. the like 24 to 290, which is the classic, super classic one that we all grew up on. But this and, is their so, full frame version of that lens. But I know you got a bunch of handheld. I know you got a bunch of wides going on in this. So what are you what are you pairing with this big ingenue, uh, you know, 12 by? Yeah. The Ingenue, you know, is just used occasionally. Really, yes, the whole season is handheld. We shot it with Tokina Cinema Vistas. Uh, which, those are incredible yeah. lenses. I, I will tell uh, you, um, they are an absolute bargain, but ho- holy crap, they, they make the most beautiful images. I myself have a set of the Vista ones, which are, you know, yeah, the, yeah I, I love them. All right, so... It's amazing. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I, I, I'm the kind of jackass that would have never even normally tested them. I don't know how they even ended up getting to. I think it was the rental house suggested. You know, you might want to take a look at these. And then they're, they're, I've met the engineer, <laughs> and I don't mean to make, turn this yeah. into a you know a Tokina love fest and going down this path. But I've met the engineer, yeah. and the guy is brilliant. I think they get overlooked and they get ignored. But you know, not everybody. You know, uh, Ted Lasso all shot on Tokinas. And, uh, Loki now season two shot on, on Tokinas. I, I think it's brilliant. It's wonderful. I, I I predict very rosy future for the people out there with Tokina lenses. Yeah. Anyway, Shout out. So, so m- moving away from from lenses, do you do you uh, have a preference for working on location versus working on a stage? Do you do you have a personal preference? What, what how do you like to work? I um, despise shooting on location and I love shooting on stage. And All the right. reason is because I'm a lighting DP, you know, cameras, cameras great. I love camera, but I do identify as a lighting guy. And on location, there's just always some kind of reason why you can't put your light where you need to put it. You know, you can't pull the walls. You can't put lights above the ceiling. You get certain things from it, you know. But if you have a great production designer and a great set deck team and just the whole art team is there, there's nothing really because texturally you can make something look as aged as you want on a build. Yeah, yeah, of course. But yeah, I'll take a stage any day. Take a stage any day. All right. So I didn't ask you, how did you get the phone call? Like, you know, was it a friend of yours? Was it networking? How did, you know, Marvel come to to tap you to, to do this? Tell the story about how you came to be associated with Loki season two. Yeah. So Loki season two, the lead directors are Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, and they were in charge of putting the whole vision for the season together creatively. You know, really what you're seeing up there, how it's so much different than season one. It's all on them. They were the ones that that really pushed to take it as far as they did. And and what it looks like is their previous body of work. They've made five films. And you'll see all of those films are just a direct progression towards Loki season two in terms of the, the evolution of the, the style. So they happen to be friends with a good friend of mine, Evan Katz, who directed the last of the three seasons of Channel Zero that I shot, Channel Zero, The Dream Door. Justin and Aaron were looking for DPs. I think they were interviewing a lot of people, but for whatever reason, the names and faces were blending together a little bit. And they were expressing that to Evan, who said, you ought to check out my good friend Isaac. I think he could be a good fit for the show. And next thing I knew, I was on, well, maybe maybe it was a feeling to say, I think he told me I pitched you for Loki last night. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. (laughs) I remember that, I remember Justin and Aaron both from Moon Knight, which previous yeah. to Loki was my favorite Marvel series. So really it's like, it's, it's their work. I think I, yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan of, but, but they're uh, incredible. Yeah. They're, 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 they're so good. So, uh, but really I hear people, you know, people ask me and I, I hear people talk about all the time, like, you know, how does someone get one opportunity or another? And the easy answer I think everyone says is it's who, you know, but it's not necessarily just who, you know, it's who, you know, that you've done good work with in the past and maybe their regular person is unavailable. And it's having that wonderful relationship with someone who says, you know, who you really ought to pay attention to is this person. And it sounds like that's exactly what happened with you. So that's great. You know, uh, what advice, what advice would you give to people out there who are looking to network better, who are looking to have those connections, who want to make sure that they get that, that strong recommendation so that they are, their name is put forward when, when the opportunities come. Do you, do you have any advice for, for those people? Good question. I think I'm not great at that myself, but I have some advice that's like adjacent to this whole process, or at least that specific question, which is it also matters what you do in the interview. Of course, it's not enough. You know, Evan didn't get me the job. He just set me up for the alley-oop, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I thought I had no chance at booking it, so I decided that I might as well throw a Hail Mary. And I did something that I thought would differentiate myself 
in their eyes, which was to present a specific vision that was very different than the first season. With regard to lighting only, all the, like I said, all the camera stuff came from them. The lighting stuff kind of came from me. So I broke down the first season in a document and all these sequences, I kind of identified about half a dozen sequences and then presented how I would have approached it if I had shot the first season. So I think that it worked, you know, but the bigger lesson there is something that I think is good career advice in general, not just with interviews, not with pitch decks, none of those specifics, but just going out of the way to differentiate yourself. Because as I was talking about earlier, there's a lot of trendy going on. Everything I just, I see just trend, trend, trend when I look at work. And I think my work has never been trendy. Loki season two is not at all trendy. The other films I've done aren't trendy. And it's really working for me. To, to define my own voice and to stand outside of the, the trendy styles that are popular now. It's difficult because that trendy work, as soon as you start to do it, it will get you hired, you know? But you're just, you're kind of going in a circle when you're doing trendy stuff because you're just getting hired by other people who want the trendy stuff, who are doing trendy stuff. And just, it's, you're all just kind of like in this trend whirlpool together and you're slowly circling down, down, down the drain. No offense, but... Uh, I- Um, (laughs) I'd say stick your neck out creatively. That's my advice. I I think that's, that's great advice. I'm going to just go out on a limb here and guess that this was, this was a a fun job, that this job was fun. You enjoy, you enjoyed every day going to work, making this one happen. How how much fun on a scale of one to 10 was it to show up to work every day? 11 out of 10. Nice. That's great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. People ask me what it was like to shoot Loki. I get that question all the time. How'd it go? What it was what was it like? And it's like it's kind of an impossible question to ask, but the answer I keep coming back to was is it was the easiest, funnest job I've ever done. It was just it was a pleasure from start to finish. And there was just nothing but support and encouragement and love through the whole process. Uh, you know what? I think that is really a great place for us to leave it. Uh, Isaac Bauman, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. It was a real, real pleasure to have you. Hey, uh, if someone wants to connect with you outside of, you know, I know they can see your work on, on Disney Plus, but uh, where can people find more of your work if they want to check you out? Are you on Instagram? Do you have a website? Where, where, where can people connect with you? Yeah. Uh, I'm fairly obsessive about keeping my website up to date. My contact info is on my website. I'm also accessible on Instagram, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Isaac Bowman, thank you so much for being on the show, and uh, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you very much, Ilya. It was, it was a pleasure to be here. All right, so that was Isaac Bowman. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody check out Loki Season 2. It's awesome. Agreed. Uh, it's so much fun. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it is our short end time of the show. What is your obsession this week? What is going on in your world? What are you all about? Well, uh, firstly, I uh, literally, fi- I, I have a short end that I really want to get to. But about five minutes before we rolled, I learned uh, something that we talked about years ago is back. And I feel like I just, I almost want to make it my short end, but there's not that much to tell. But it's that Kodak, who had, what, five years ago announced that they were coming out with a new Super 8 camera? I love Super 8. You you and I did a project on Super 8, and it was 20 years ago. That's how freaking old we are. <laughs> but we, we hand-processed yeah. our own Super 8 uh, film, damn it. And, That's true. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I love Super 8. I think it's an amazing format. The first film I ever made, I shot on black and white Super 8. I think Super 8's cool. Uh, so Kodak releasing a new Super 8 camera sounded very exciting to me. And then they announced the camera and they were like, and the Super 8 camera is going to set you back. It was like 3500 bucks, And it was like sad trombone. I'm not buying a $3,500 Super 8 camera. I mean, like, I, I'm very excited about Super 8. And then they went radio silence on it for years. Now, the thing about it was that like when you bought the film, you were also buying the processing and also a 4K transfer, which they would send you on a digital file. The camera has like a like an SD card that I think you can run sound into or maybe you use it for proxies. I'm not exactly sure. It's got a flip out thing. It looks really cool. But I now the price is listed at fifty five hundred dollars and I'm equally, if not more so like yeah, I would love to make something on Super 8, but that camera is priced to rent. 
for Super 8. Like if a rental house had that and I could rent it for a few hundred bucks for a week, I might I might give it a shot, but I'm not going to go out and buy a $5,500 Super 8 camera because that, my friends, in my opinion, is too niche. But anyway, here is my actual short end. Sorry to, to sidetrack oh, you. Oh, that, that's not your short end. I mean, I guess I could make it my short end, but I oh, have okay. something that I think is actually a really exciting new product that I think oh. people should check out. Okay. Um, there is an iPad app that's been around for a long time called Procreate, and Procreate is a drawing app. And oh, yeah. I know professional artists use it, although I was talking to our- Also, uh, my 11-year-old daughter. She spends hours every day on Procreate. She, she thinks it, it's great. It's, yeah. it's a great drawing app. Now, I did actually mention it to a friend of the show, Tony Libertori, a uh, storyboard artist of Fast and the Furious and- Captain America and a bunch of Marvel stuff, like, you know, one of the most busiest, most prolific uh, storyboard artists. And he said he thought Procreate was pretty cool, but he didn't like the way it did layers. And there were some things about that he didn't like. But I brought it up to him this week because Procreate released a video editing app called Procreate Dreams. Hmm. And Procreate Dreams is a lot of things. It is a nonlinear editing system. So you could bring in footage and edit it on there. And it's also an animation platform. So you could use it to draw your animations, Procreate style. You can also bring in, like, let's say you've made a multi-layered character in Procreate. You can bring it in and animate it. Like, literally do all your animation in, in Procreate Dreams. You could add sound. You can add music. You can, you can do all these things. And it's only 20 bucks. And it's not like a subscription it's not a subscription model. It's a $20 application. Uh, runs on, as far as I can tell, most iPads. The nonlinear editing doesn't seem extremely sophisticated as far as nonlinear editing goes, but I think for someone who has an interest with some animation styles and skills or bringing in video and adding a little bit of animation flourishes to it, I, I think you could do worse. And it, it seems very uh, optimized for using an iPad with like an Apple Pencil. It's something I'm very interested in because I see it and I go like, oh, this is going to bring new opportunities to post-production that I hadn't really thought about. Like you could bring in video and do hand rotoscoping in there if you wanted to. There's a bunch of things, cool things you can do. All the tools of Procreate, which there are so many amazing brushes and pencils and styles and, you know, colors, blah, 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 that you can do in Procreate. And now you can do that and make it move, you know, you, you could take the animated character and make it look like it was on oil painting or make it look like acrylic or watercolor. Like you can do all that stuff in Procreate. And I think uh, we're going to see people doing some really interesting creative stuff. And it's not like canned effects. It's like what I love about a tool like this is it kind of opens up your creativity to do interesting stuff and kind of takes the barriers, the technological barriers between your creativity and you away and just kind of lets you interface with the art itself. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what gets done in this. And I've been, you know, watching a bunch of YouTube videos about what people are using it for right now. That sounds awesome. So tell your daughter, that sounds... tell your daughter to get on that, <laughs> get on it. Uh, maybe, maybe she will, maybe she'll, she'll blow us all away with what she can do. Anyway, my short end squid game, the challenge. Have you seen this squid game, the challenge? Uh, it sounds like a reality show. So the answer is no, I don't really watch those. It is a reality show and holy crap, if you like Squid Game, I think you will like this because this is probably the darkest and most subversive, challenging reality show that has ever been out there. And I'm not gonna spoil anything for you here, Ben. You will know if you have any interest at all if you watch episode one, because when they eliminate players in this reality show, a squib goes off in their chest. And oh, I think it fun. was, it was very good taste. It's not like red blood. It's like black or something. But still, they've given instructions to all the competitors that when they're eliminated, they then have to like fall over and play dead, which is so dark and so macabre and also wonderful to watch. So it's like these people are like, oh, crap. And then poof, the squib goes off and then they have to they be should, like, they should do that on Jeopardy. They <laughs> That, you know, I, I, I mean, have a feeling what, what Jeopardy are you really in? <laughs> well, let's 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 really amp this up a little bit. You know, uh, it is so dark. It is it is brings back all the feels and vibes of the original Squid Game, of course, the the, the narrative Netflix series, which is 
wonderful. And I'm very much now looking forward to, to season two. But they did something slightly un Netflix like they dropped most of the episodes. But I think there's one or two left that are going to go live in about a week. So it's very much building anticipation. Anyone can can watch it right now and get caught up and not see the finale of who wins. And I think this might be a record, too, for the largest cash prize ever in like reality huh. television history. The winner gets four point five million dollars. I'm not aware of any other reality show that's given away four and a half million, nor made the contestants play dead with a squib exploding on their chest. That is, that is unusual. <laughs> so uh, so there's something wonderfully delightful and dark about this. And it's really interesting to watch. And they haven't put people in the the clear, like, you know, the real peril of like, oh, they're going to fall to their their death. They have these different, you know, sorts of things. Of, oh, I mean, you, that's the next being step, though, but, is like, you know, like swapping them, doing a Texas switch with a fake body that they like, tear in half or something. There, there's been plenty of re- reality show parody movies about like people hunting people and other sorts of like dark yeah. things going on. There's a, there's a whole history of those. And I don't think we're actually really heading towards that world. But the squid game but I'm saying they could they could fake it they could fake it effectively with a texas switch you have them like walk behind a pole and then like you know a guillotine slices a bo- slices a replica of their body in half and glitter falls out it's not really them we all know it but you you film it in such a way that that you can sell it there's a way to do that I, there, there, 100% call, call, is. call me squid game people i'll help you i'll help you figure out how to how to make your uh, on-screen <laughs> reality show murders look have more verisimilitude just you wait ben i think they might call you because uh you know i don't know what call season me. two of squid game is going to be but i i definitely feel like squid game of course entirely influences everything about this show and uh, anyone who's a fan of Squid Game will uh, have appropriate anticipation for what's going on but even if you never ever watch Squid Game I actually think that watching Squid Game the challenge might inspire some people to give Squid Game a try and I think that's exactly what Netflix is thinking too they should also add scripts to cake boss anyway <laughs> or or pretty much any other show where people are eliminated you want to make every that a- show yeah <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> Instead of like needs a werewolf, it's needs a squib, needs a, you know, needs a bloody death. Yeah. Why don't yeah. they call it squib games? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, sorry. No, I, I know you couldn't resist. It, it only took me 10 minutes to arrive <laughs> at that joke. Anyway. <laughs> hey, Ben, uh, who do we have to thank for putting the show together? Who do we have to thank for making this episode happen? I mean, as always, Alana Cody, uh, we'd be nowhere without her. We'd be stumbling around in the wilderness like complete fools without, without our producer, Alana Cody. Mm lost yeah yeah we have uh we were if you want to know what that would be like go back in time about five years ago when yeah season two have, yeah <laughs> yeah we'd have like one new episode every six months um it was like know. four months but but yeah you're not you're not wrong it was pretty awful anyway uh so alana cody we are we are where we are because of her uh we should also thank uh ben katz our intrepid editor who uh has uh, we've thrown all this video at him and now also a video a, a, a separate video camera with rolling artifacts yeah that's fun Be- yeah I, 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 I get to sh- i get to troubleshoot and figure this out for next week so much for making this a zero lift i really wanted to make it so it's like i didn't absolutely nothing that just like the podcast i could come in here i have the mixer set up i turn the microphone on i talk into the webcam the end but yeah that that wasn't meant to be so now yeah, it's, for gonna me, be- it's like this is my zoom setup by the way whenever anyone is on a zoom with me they're like hey i feel like i'm on a podcast and i'm like there's a reason for that it's because this is my <laughs> podcast setup you're looking at it right now so for me it'll be now uh i'm worried a slippery slope of introducing more stuff I, I you know i feel like jump forward a year and it's going to be like grip gack everywhere there's going to be a 12 by bounce over here it's going to be it's going to be, be a whole making thing it for the vision pro headset and and we'll be like you know doing lidar scans of our faces in 3d and making meta humans of ourselves screw oh, yes. that gaussian splats everywhere gaussian splat the hell out of us <laughs> anyway uh, so so uh ben did you thank k's already did, did I, I, miss I, I didn't thank k's and i'm okay, not gonna i'm gonna make you do it Okay, well, let's thank Kay Zalatrachi. Kay's composed the music that you heard for this show and is rumored to be composing more music for us, which I, I can't wait to hear. I haven't heard it yet. We're very much looking forward to that. Kay's is a all multi- All klezmer. I think he's replacing it all with klezmer <laughs> music and slide whistles. 
Uh, where is that klezmer theremin uh you know uh, collaboration that 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 we know should exist uh, that's awesome i want a klezmer <laughs> theremin band you and i can form it so uh Kays is a extremely talented multi-hyphenate in that he is a composer he composes music but he also does all kinds of other crazy technical and artistic things like directs and writes and produces and colors and creates He's like visual effects. buying weird circuits to make uh, custom synthesizers that no one else on earth has right now. He's it's, it, there's it, a whole community of those people. They're, they're, they're very hardcore. It's really, it's really interesting. Actually, if that's a rabbit hole, you can go down for sure. Yeah. Yeah, he's not and, a tailor, a soldier, nor a spy, but he is a tinkerer. I'll tell you definitely a tinkerer. I gotta tell uh, you this guy. <laughs> tankering yeah so so ben uh where can people find you they want to track you down outside this show uh track me down at benrock.com go to benrock.com and you can uh find all my information and social media stuff and uh, watch my reel and uh read my bio my bio find me on linkedin or twitter or something yell at me i refuse to call it x i'm still gonna call it twitter how about yourself, Ilya? Where can people find you? Most of the time, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. If you want to connect with me on anything social, uh, then it's work-related. Hit me up over at LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash Ilya Friedman. That's me. That's how you That's how you get me. It just rolls off the tongue. That, so easy. You know, All those yeah. forward slashes. Exactly. Everyone loves the forward slash. Uh, ben, Especially I got... the kids. The kids like them, don't they? <laughs> They're always talking about forward slash. Hashtag forward slash. Didn't Fatboy Slim do a song about that? Yeah, I think he did. Got to stay real current with the Fatboy yeah. Slim, Slim <laughs> reference. <laughs> Bringing up the Fatboy Slim there, because, you know, that's what all the kids are listening to. All right, so Ben. You know, uh, you know what a thing that I love about Fatboy Slim, and you brought it up, is uh, 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 Weapon of Choice. If you listen to the lyrics, that song is about Dune. Is it really? Walk without rhythm, and it won't attract a worm. What is he talking about? Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, but I think that's the only line. I don't think any other part of that is, I think that's, that's just a throw in there for the super uber nerds like yourself there who. who song know. is about Dune. Anyway, you were saying something more important. <laughs> you want to take us out? Thanks for listening and watching. Yeah, all right, it works. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.